Hello, welcome to the virtual celebration for the Analog Analytical Laboratory and Asimov's Readers Award. My name is Emily Hockaday and I'm Managing Editor of Analog and Asimov's. You'll be hearing from some of our wonderful authors tonight who have prepared statements of acceptance and from both editors. Sheila Williams will be announcing the Asimov's Readers Award winners and Trevor Cashry will be announcing the Analog Analytical Laboratory Awards. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Trevor Cashery, editor of Analog Science Fiction and Fact. Welcome to the 2020 AnLab Readers Award results. Uh, we're going to have a few words from the authors in a moment, but before we do that, I'd just like to take a second to say thank you to everybody who made this possible, ranging from those authors to all of the readers who took the time to uh, vote and um, weigh in on the kind of stories that they'd like to see more of in the future. So, without further ado, let's begin. First place in the novella category goes to The Gorilla in a Tutu Principle, or Pecan Pie at Mini and Earls, by Adam Troy Castro. This isn't the first time Adam has won a, a Reader's Award. Uh, in fact, he won for the predecessor to this story called uh, Sunday Night Yams at Mini and Earls. Uh, so in some ways, it's no surprise that this was uh, as popular as it was, but uh, still a well-deserved win nonetheless. The winner in the novelette category is Bone Hunters by Harry Turtledove. On this, Harry says, Winning the Analog Award means a lot to me, because Analog means a lot to me, and has for a very long time. I started reading Analog in the fall of 1960. It was the only SF magazine my junior high library carried, and it hooked me right away. John Campbell influenced the way I think probably a good deal more than I'm consciously aware of. I had an idea for a story that I thought might interest him, but I made a couple of feckless lunges at it, and then gave up. He passed away before I could figure out how to do it right. I got one of my first encouraging rejections from Ben Bova for a piece that eventually sold elsewhere. And, when I eventually hauled out that old idea and finished it, Stan Schmidt first told me what was wrong with my story, then bought it after I fixed enough of the flaws to satisfy him. Her Big Hauro ran in the October 1984 issue, and have sold more pieces to Analog than I have anywhere else. But this is my first Analog award. When Emily told me I'd won, my answering email was simply, Oh my god. It took me two more tries before I managed to deal with everything her note told me she needed. I want to thank everybody who liked Bone Hunters. I particularly want to thank Trevor, who liked it enough to buy it. And I want to thank David Boop, for whose anthology, Straight Out of Dodge City, I created the milieu in which Rekek and Junior live. Finally, having read Analog for all these many years, I know the that Analog winner used to get an extra cent a word for his or her story. Such a fine old custom, in this writer's opinion, at least deserves reviving. Well, that's a tough one to do when you're Harry Turtle Duff to begin with. First place in the short story category goes to All Tomorrow's Parties by Phoebe North. It's significant because Phoebe is a new-to-analog author, and a win in the highly competitive short story category is a meaningful accomplishment. It's also worth noting that it's a time travel story, and I'm generally very picky about them. It's hard to make a time travel story that feels like hard science fiction, so a piece that used the idea really has to uh, stand out for me to take it. And this one does. It has real humanity, and it's something to be proud of. First place in the fact article category this year is The Venus Sweet Spot, Floating Home, by John J. Vester. John has a few words he'd like to say. Hi, I'm John Vester. I'm here to accept the uh, AnLab Award for Best Nonfiction Article of 2019. Uh, the title of the article was The Venus Sweet Spot, Floating Home. And boy, I gotta say, it's a great surprise to even be nominated. Um, so much so that I didn't even vote for my own article. Um, but this is wonderful. And to be in such great company, uh, Gregory Benford and C. Stuart Hardwick, my fellow nominees, it's just incredible to me and for my first analog fact article. There are a lot of people to thank, the readers of course. Um, they're what makes writing exciting for a writer. And because of them, the AnLab Awards are really very meaningful. It's a true measure of a writer's success in reaching his audience. So thank you, readers of Analog, and uh, I hope you'll like future offerings from me. I want to say thank you to editor Trevor Cotri for having faith in this untested writer. Thanks to also to Emily Hockaday and Carol DeMont for making the business part of the experience so smooth and pleasant. I must also thank Stan Schmidt, former Analog Editor, 
for encouraging me so many years ago as I went down this path of writing. Um, Stan bought my first fiction piece for Analog, and I'll never forget his many kindnesses. I want to thank my wife Nancy for giving me the support and the space to do my writing, and also her love. We just celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary, and so our marriage is exactly half as old as Analog is right now. Finally, I want to express my appreciation to John Powell, the mad genius of Rancho Cordova. We call him JP. His quest to achieve orbit through buoyancy is what inspired the article. I uh, have been volunteering for JP Aerospace, America's other space program, for a few years now, and it's always been exciting and rewarding and fascinating. This AnLab award is an honor for me, but the article honors his work. I hope to appear more often in Analog, but um, it would take an awful lot to surpass the thrill of this AnLab award. Thank you all. top award in the poetry category this year goes to a first-time poet in analog and a first-time winner but a name that analog readers should know very well Stan Schmidt for Sequoias and Other Myths. Stan? I'd like to thank American Airlines for inadvertently inspiring this poem. A couple of nebulas back in San Jose we were about to check out of our hotel to go home when we got an email from American saying the first leg of your flight has been delayed and you won't make your connection. Would you like to rebook? They offered us a red eye that night, but I talked them into putting us on the same flight we'd been scheduled for, but one day later. The hotel and car rental company gave us one night extensions. So suddenly, we had a whole afternoon and evening to fill. Whatever could we do? Actually, we'd never had trouble doing that in California. Usually we try to get in at least one hike in a coast redwood or giant sequoia forest, but on this trip we hadn't managed to do that. Suddenly, unexpectedly, we had the opportunity. We found a redwood forest within reach of a day trip and spent the afternoon hiking through it. While we were doing so, Joyce asked, if you lived in a world where these didn't exist and somebody told you about them, would you believe them? I thought about that and decided people who in such a world might not believe in such trees. I wondered what they might believe instead. And that set my little poem loose upon the world. So even more than American, I'd like to thank Joyce for asking the right question, Emily for buying the poem, suggesting a good tweak to it, and giving it a perfect illustration, and all the readers who voted for it. Thank you all very much. And last but certainly not least, we have first place for the best cover, which goes to the January-February 2019 issue with a cover by Donato Giancola for Tom Jolly's story, Ring Wave. It's a uh, terrific cover that illustrates an exciting story, and uh, it's exactly the kind of thing I like to feature, and it looks terrific, and uh, couldn't be happier that the readers selected it. Welcome to Asimov's 34th Annual Readers Award Celebration. Every year, the readers of our magazine pick their favorite stories, poetry, and art. And we have always thrown a big ba a, a, a breakfast celebration the morning of the Nebula Awards, which, to which we invite the winners, or on a few occasions, a party at uh, Worldcon, where we're able to invite a few more people. But this is the first time We've ever held the ceremony online, and so now we're thrilled and delighted that we are able to invite everyone, winners, finalists, readers, all of you. So hope you will enjoy our ceremony. Thank you for coming. Our first award is for Best Novella. The winner of this award is Suzanne Palmer for her story, Water Lines, which appeared in our July-August 2019 issue. Suzanne writes to say, Hello everyone, I hope today finds you well, in body if not also in spirit. 
I know I am not alone right now in feeling an incredible dissonance between moments of personal joy juxtaposed against the backdrop of profound, incalculable catastrophe. And it is times like these when it is hard not to question why we do what we do and if it serves in any meaningful capacity. There are more important voices than my own fighting the good fight with eloquence and style and beautifully sharp edges, and they are desperately important now more than ever. Fiction can rally us, heal us, comfort us, and when necessary, discomfort us. When I wrote Waterlines, our world was a different place, but I think what I wanted from this story in my own quieter, sometimes goofier, but no less implacable ways still stands. First and foremost, to tell a fun story, but also to tell one where, even in a bleak place, while there are ordinary people willing to open their eyes and do the right thing when that choice is put before them, there remains always the possibility of a better future. Also, of course, I wanted giant underwater robots. It is an enormous honor to have one's words read by others and found worth the reader's time, whether it is for the robots or the everyday hero or just for the escape into some fictional person's problems and away from our own for a while. Thank you so much for the kindness of your time and for this award. I wish each and every one of you peace and better times ahead. Our award for best novelette goes to Mercurio D. Rivera for his story in the stillness between the stars, which was published in our September, October, 2019 issue. Mercurio has sent in his own pre-recorded speech. Hello everyone. I'm excited and honored that my story in the stillness between the stars finished atop the Asimov readers award poll in the novelette category. I'm deeply grateful to the editorial team at Asimov's, Sheila Williams for accepting and editing the story, and Emily Hockaday for all her help. Sheila decided the story was a perfect fit for the special spooky issue that the magazine puts out every year around Halloween, and she asked me if she could hold on to it until the fall of 2019. And this is where I have to confess that the best part about publishing a story in what I consider to be the premier science fiction magazine is that sweet anticipation prior to actual publication being able to tell people who ask me what's new in my writing, oh, by the way, I have a story coming out in Asimov's. And in this case, there was this very special added bonus of being a finalist in the Reader's Award poll and having my name mentioned in the same breath as some truly amazing writers I admire, like Andy Duncan, Suzanne Palmer, James Van Pelt, and Lawrence Watt Evans. Also, although I've published four stories with Asimov's, this, was my, uh, this one was very special to me because it was my first cover story. And I have no doubt that it was because it was a cover story with beautiful artwork by Dominic Carmen that it received more attention and led to more readers reading it and voting for it. Um, I'd like to thank my amazingly talented writers group, Ultra Fluid, for providing invaluable feedback that helped push this story to the next level. Now, in my story, two characters aboard the Seed, a massive and empty generation ship larger than Beijing, are stalked by a monster, a manifestation of their guilt. And in the very brief excerpt I'll be reading, just a few paragraphs to give you a taste, the protagonist, the psychiatrist, confronts Angie, a woman who's been awakened from suspended animation by nightmares. She begins uh, the interaction by telling her therapist she's been hearing this repeating, haunting music in the mechanical recesses of the spaceship. Since I woke up, I've started hearing it, she said to him, coming out of the seed's ventilators, a high note, a lower one, then another. The other day, I swear I heard it in the elevator, except the elevators on the seed don't play music. Crazy, huh? She caught herself, clearly unhappy with the word she'd chosen. He'd heard of psychological priming, a past stimulus coloring a person's future response to similar experiences, making them see numbers or patterns that didn't really exist but not manifested in this way, with music. That's not all, she said. I'd been dreaming of something twisted, dirty, a shadow, a shadow that follows me wherever I go, just out of sight. And the past two days, I, I've sensed it even when I'm awake. I'm afraid it's been freed from my mind, set loose on the, on the seed. It's after me, it wants to punish me. I see, he said. And what exactly is this thing that's after you? 
She bit her lip. A monster. That's all I know. It hides in the dark. But if I pay attention to it, I can see movement. Black within black. Out of the corner of my eye. I saw it clearly. Just once, for a second. If I stare directly at it, it disappears. He removed his scribbler from his pocket and handed it to her. Can you draw what you saw? She stared at the hexagonal device. Is this library tech? He nodded. Good, because I'm a lousy artist. She dragged her index finger along the surface for a few seconds until the device read her intentions and made adjustments to the image on its own. She handed it back to him. At first, I caught a glimpse of it crouching behind the REM pod stacks, she said. Then I spotted the shadow at the far end of a corridor, distant enough that I wasn't sure it was real, about eight feet tall, shrouded in a black mist. It has this stench of rotting flesh. But what scared me, what truly scared me, was when it spoke. It whispered profanities, promised to skin me alive. I know how this sounds, doctor. I'm not an idiot. I know what you're thinking, the same thing I'm thinking, that I'm hallucinating, that it's not real, that it's just my guilt getting the better of me. I woke you, in fact, to convince me of this, to prove I'm imagining it, that it's all in my head, because the alternative, the lower lip twitched. I'm afraid that the hallucination, if that's what it is, is taking over. She leaned forward, her face inches away from his. The monster's creeping closer and closer every time I see it. And in the end, if I believe it's real, if I believe it strongly enough, it doesn't much matter whether it's actually real, right? That's why I need you to make me stop believing. He stared at the sketch on the scribbler. The image resembled a diseased black bird. A huge shroud with a tattered outline, only it bore a human head and a face that looked just like Angie's. I'll stop there. So once again, I want to thank uh, the Asimov's team, and I want to thank all the readers who read the story and voted for it. I am humbly and deeply grateful. Thank you so much. The award for best short story goes to Ted Kosmatka for Sacrificial Iron, which appeared in our May-June 2019 issue. Ted says, I'd like to say thanks to the whole team at Asimov's Magazine and to Sheila for this wonderful award and thanks to the readers of Asimov's who voted again to bestow this honor upon me. I'm humbled and grateful and will never take for granted how lucky I am to have an outlet for my crazy ideas. I'd like to say thanks to R.J. Carey who did such a great job reading the podcast and making it sound good. Thanks to my longtime crit crew, the Mean Group, who took the time to critique the early drafts. That's Mike Poor, Mary Tina Brijas, and Janine Harrison. Thanks also to my wife and to my mom, who both still read everything I write. Thanks to my buddy, Bert, who's always hounding me for a good space story. Thanks to Asmos for providing a home to the readers for making it all worth it. I am more grateful than I know how to express. The award for best poem goes to Jane Yolen for her for A Street Away, which appeared in our January, February 2019 issue. Jane says, it's been that kind of year. Fell in love with an old college boyfriend, and I mean old, me being 81, he 83. Our not exactly a honeymoon in Europe scrambled by the virus, our stay in one place, his home, complicated by breaking my hip, him breaking his knee, our dog dying, and me writing this thank you 20 minutes before heading out for gum surgery. But now I am elated. Thanks, Asimov's readers. Thanks, Emily and Sheila and Asimov, you old rogue, wherever you landed. Thanks, universe. There's a bit of juice left in the old dame yet. My 389th book should be out any minute. Let's all dance at my 400th. Our award for best cover goes to Maurizio Manzieri. His beautiful work appeared on our July-August cover and illustrated Suzanne Palmer's story, Waterlines. Hi, I am Maurizio Manzieri, a science fiction and fantasy illustrator based in uh, Turin, Italy. I'm here in my studio, safe and healthy, considering the period, uh, surrounded by books, uh, virtual brushes for my drawing tablet 
so computer and a huge collection of uh, uh, old Isaac Asimov science fiction magazines. He, I've been a subscriber to the magazine since 1986 uh, and sometimes I like to browse uh, uh, the old issues. Uh, this one for an example, uh, it was published in uh, 1992. It was a tribute to Asimov when uh, the year he passed away. Uh, the cover was by Michael Whelan. So while uh, reading the, those old issues, uh, I, I was very fond of uh, uh, illustration, painting and so on. And I said, one day, I want to be on the front cover of Isaac Asimov magazine. So in uh, two 2015, I won my first Reader's Award uh, with this cover, this one. The, this was a very lucky cover. It was very appreciated uh, because it appeared originally as a, for the Italian edition of Paradise is Lost by Ursula Le Guin. It was included in Spectrum, uh, then appeared in several other, many other editions, such as this one. And the year after that, the, the, after this award, I, I won again with this other, another Asimov uh, award, beautiful, wow, amazing with this cover, with the, an original illustration realized for uh, Aliette de Baudard for the story, uh, The Citadel of Weeping Parts. It was also a finalist, a nominee for the Chesley Award in, in the, the, that year. Uh, uh, now I'm again in, on the podium, of course, I'm here for the, an award uh, for this cover. Uh, this is the original illustration I, that I have realized for uh, Susan Palmer for the story Waterlands. Uh, it has been awarded as best cover of uh, 2019. It's exciting. I'm uh, really honored to accept uh, this award 100 years uh, from the birth of uh, Isaac Asimov and with a robot on the cover too, you see? Tell me, what more could I wish for? Incredible. I wish to thank um, all the readers uh, who voted for me, the publishers, uh, the editors appreciating my art. A great special thanks uh, to the art director, Victoria Green, for uh, granting me artistic freedom during the execution of the works. Well, I hope to meet you all during one of the next international events soon, I hope. And meanwhile, see you on the next covers. Bye. Bye from Italy. Thank you so much for tuning in with us tonight. And please don't forget to vote on your favorite stories from 2020.